Welcome to uh, today's event. Um, the topic today is uh, the future of Homo sapiens um, and uh, put on by the uh, Center for Human Success Meetup. Uh, Center for Human Success is a nonprofit focused on sparking discussion around the really big issues of the century, um, and human enhancement is, uh, in our opinion, one of them. And um, yeah, so before I answer tonight, uh, I'll give a presentation. We'll have a Q&A session with uh, Philip Chen, who works in the industry. Uh, and then we'll open up here and have a group discussion at the end. Um, and if any at any point during the presentation anything isn't clear or you have any questions, just raise your hand and this is meant to be interactive. Um, and I will be asking you guys questions throughout um, to prompt some some thinking as we go along. So are we ready? Good. So 13 and a half billion years ago we were all at one dense point of energy. Um, about Three billion years ago, we were our ancestors were bacteria, terraforming and, and adapting to the uh, relatively new planet. Uh, over the last hundred thousand years, uh, Homo sapiens has been uh, well appeared and, and has been constantly evolving since, um, and that evolution has continued uh, even in the last few hundred years. Um, every time there's a major war or a major famine or a major disease as a selection event that alters our DNA. Um, and so um, we continue to evolve um, uh, up until today. So the question is, where are we going? Um, and what the reason is such a big deal is that right now, uh, we are, over the next few decades, we are at a point where for the first time in human history, uh, for the first time in, in the history of life on Earth, and, and possibly the first time in, in the history of the universe, we actually have the ability to consciously shape our future. Um, and needless to say, this is, this is I mean, to a certain extent we've been able to shape our, our future in the past, for example, with eugenics and with, you know, even things like nutrition, I mean, some ways you're enhancing yourself or taking a coffee, but this is the first time where we can really radically rethink, you know, what kind of species we want to be, what kind of uh, abilities we want to have. Uh, and uh, in that sense, this is, uh, well, if it wasn't for general AI, this would be the biggest issue of the century in my mind. So we bring it down to, okay, so we have this, this, this radical new ability coming online. Um, two questions, what can we do? Uh, specifically, what kind of technologies we develop? What kind of things can we add to ourselves or, or modify about ourselves? Uh, and the second thing is, okay, given that, well, what should we do? Um, and so the presentation is broken down into those two pieces. Part one of which is what can we do? So where, what can the technology enable? Uh, what can we expect? Um, and where is the technology today? So there are many ways to organize these. There's a whole different bunch of ways where, where the, the technology will lead, but there's three rough categories. One is curing aging. One is enhancing ourselves in a biological sense. Um, and the last one is the sort of merging with machines, uh, bionics, prosthetics, and, and uh, neurotechnology. That very first one, so immortality and curing aging. Now, traditionally, um, aging was seen as a sort of this natural thing, it wasn't a disease, it's not just, a, just you know, part of life, uh, it's not something that needs quote unquote curing. And, and there's certainly a very valid philosophical viewpoint to maintain that. But from a technical standpoint, um, the aging of the human body is essentially identical to the aging of a car or the aging of any other physical uh, dynamic system. Um, there's simply no system is perfect um, and there's going to be wear and tear, uh, and wear and tear accumulates um, and eventually becomes catastrophic and, and the, either the, the vehicle fails or the human fails or whatever dynamic system you have. So given that, uh, what, you know, how would we go about curing human aging? Uh, there are various aspects you can look at. One is to fundamentally change the human metabolism, like the way the human body works. Um, another is to sort of look at the geriatric side, wait until things fail and then try to fix them as they fail. Um, but the third and most promising, uh, and this has been pushed by a, a gentleman named uh, Aubrey Gray, who's sort of famous for um, the uh, longevity of topics, is to, to look at fixing the damage. So, as, as our bodies, you know, as we, for example, we're just walking down the hallway, you're doing a small amount of damage to your body. Um, as, as you do, uh, 
the, the, the idea here is to focus on that instead of trying to, to stop that damage from happening, instead of, of waiting for it to get so bad that you have you know, hip replacement, um, to continuously rejuvenate the body and to slowly uh, re to, to repair the damage as you go along. Um, and so you could end up with, you know, um, these three young looking people could in fact be, if you end up being able to cure aging, you know, they could be 240 years old, um, assuming they don't get shot or hit by a car. But in terms of purely the aging process, if you can uh, continuously rejuvenate the body as you go along, which is very, very difficult to do, obviously, but it's within the laws of physics, and there's no law that says you can't do this. It's just a matter of engineering. Uh, then, then you could be seen uh, by myself. And so there's a, a small but growing movement uh, sort of uh, calling for the uh, abolishing death, which um, is a whole, uh, I mean, there's a technical side, there's also a very philosophical side. And I look forward to those who came through the philosophy group that uh, hear your comments on this. But so what would extreme longevity mean for a society? Like what actually happens if people live to 120 to 240 years old? If you have you know a thousand year old you know citizens in your society, like how does that work? Um, at the very least, you could reduce suffering on a mass scale. There's the old saying: the uh, getting old isn't persistent, um, and and there's truly you know quite a bit of suffering for anyone who's who's in that, haven't had that yet, fortunately. But um, just watching my parents or my grandparents, you know, there's a lot of suffering involved with, with aging, and if you can cure aging, uh, you could get rid of suffering on a mass scale from every person in the world for possibly, you know, possibly you know, decades or, or hundreds of years of suffering eliminated, which if you do the math um, is, is a, a very big deal. The other thing is, if you don't die, then you don't lose your skills, right? Um, so you could, you know, if you have you know, a PhD in, in math, um, or you know, say you're an excellent carpenter or whatever it is, that skill set you can continuously work on and improve on over your, you know, hundreds of years. So, so there's a sense of, in terms of becoming experts at, 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 at various aspects, um, it really you know, maintains the, the economic uh, capacity of the human being to not have people you know, get a little in their minds and run or physically get weak. And of course, in general, uh, the elderly are wiser. Um, and so if you have a society where the average age is 150, um, that leads to a very different type of decision making and feel to a place than, than if the average age is 20. Um, so those are some of the really some of the main sort of really positive points of the idea of what we could cure aging, um, what it looked like. Um, now there there are some awkwardnesses or some awkward things about this. Um, for example, um, would it be okay to date your Great, great, great granddaughter, or it's you know five or six generations, and there's enough genetic diversity. Um, that kind of question becomes, um, you know, so so how does how does that work? You know, and, and the whole bunch of, of um, uh, yeah, the, there's a sense that like a lot of our our, our way we structure our families, the way we live together. There's a lot of assumptions around. Okay, this is how this is what it looks like. Usually, doesn't go beyond four generations, and, and by that point, you'd be it's a baby and a great great grandparent. Um, that does create a lot of disorientation, confusion, and, and it will be a, a big aspect to deal with through that too. The other thing is, of course, um, if people don't die, then then there's a lot of problems with power struggle because there's a lot. I mean, the classic case is, is you know the dictator that's been around for 30 years and still has stranglehold because you know. Um, I think of someone like you know Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. I mean, eventually in his 90s, he eventually got weak enough that they were able to push him out. But um, imagine if he'd been healthy and strong for another 100 years, um, and even like in a less, uh, uh, I guess, you know, grandiose version of that, in families, I mean, there's always you know there's a lot of the patriarchal strife struggles of one of the old guard give up control of the family business or you know, that kind of stuff. If there is no you know death or dying, there's a lot of these things that will need to be ironed out. Um, so it, it, it does add a lot of, yeah, there's some things to think about. The overpopulation piece is an interesting one because it's, it could lead to overpopulation and you change nothing else and if nobody starts to die, then you have this explosion of population. But there are a number of things going on at the same time 
hopefully by this point, uh, we'd be starting to colonize other planets, uh, or at the very least, we'd be much better at, at um, adjusting our fertility rates. Um, there are solutions to this, but it's true that from, from a purely mathematical standpoint, if nothing else changes, will there be a population issue to deal with? And of course, uh, you know, uh, you, you use your resources on, on, on the planets, that kind of thing. There again, that technology is better, we'll be able to use our resources better, but you know, it's, it's one of the more useful things about um, and, and so, to, to all of this put together would lead to a fundamental shift in values um, and, uh, and, and how we live our lives. I mean, we already think life is precious, but if, if the expectation is you can live to a thousand years old, um, that makes it, I mean, that much more vulnerable as someone to die. Um, the other thing is too is, I mean, if, if you're living your life, um, I'm assuming most people here are roughly expecting to, to, to live until 80 or something like that. Um, how would you live your life differently if you were expecting to live to a thousand? Uh, would you be in a rush to go to university? Would you be in a rush to do a bunch of stuff that's, I mean, there's just a bunch of like fundamental assumptions that come with the, this age, uh, we, we change the, the average the expectation of, of how long you live. Uh, suddenly, wearing your seat, so your, your seat belt in your car becomes that much more, you know, uh, uh, valuable. Now, okay, so so that's the theory. Now, in practice, where is that? Um, today, most of it is still just curing disease. You know, they talk about you know one disease at a time. Um, but there's a really interesting uh, uh, development. Uh, I guess a couple of years ago, um, and it's underway now. The U.S. Federal Drug Administration. <coughs> approved a, a, a diabetes drug called, for trials called metformin. Um, and the reason is interesting is because they approved it for the medical condition of, of aging. So the first time in history that, that the, the aging was recognized as a disease that can be, if not fully cured, to treat it. Um, and this speaks to a, a what many are calling a, a third revolution in medicine. Uh, so the first, well, well the third, I guess, uh, um, Approach to medicine. The first one was sort of the religious, um, uh, you know, pre pre um, uh, 1900s. Um, uh, there was a, so the assumption that you should be with God and God will decide with the person. Uh, the second one was when they discovered things like penicillin and, and vaccines. That they did sort of model of you, you die because of a disease that's an external pathogen. And this third wave is this idea that most of your issues are are like the chronic issues like either Alzheimer's or things like diabetes. All of that is just the body not being able to repair itself fast enough, um, and so this this third approach to medicine, which is in development, will probably take decades before it's fully uh, becomes mainstream, um, is really looking at uh, the, if you can cure aging, if you can take on aging directly, you can cure probably a whole bunch of diseases at the same time instead of trying to piecemeal, you know, deal with you know one or the other. Um, so this is a, a, a big piece, but it's still a long way to go. Um, the, so there's a, there's a thing called longevity escape velocity, which is the idea that, um, so say 10 years from now, the first batch of rejuvenation therapies become available, and they're not perfect, you know, it's, it's the first draft, but they can maybe they will buy you five or 10 years. Um, but the thing is, by then, 10 years later, there'll be a, a second batch of rejuvenation therapies, which will probably be better, um, and then that'll buy you some more time. And it, the, the, the longevity of state velocity is the point where the technology for rejuvenation is, is developing faster than your aging. Um, and at that point, you would only die of things like you getting shot or, or you know, non-aging uh, related causes. And there's a sense that um, if you're young enough today and, and lucky enough, um, you may be able to benefit from this. And this you know, as they say, by 50 years from now, um, there are even 30, 40 years from now, there are some cell rejuvenation therapies. Um, you know that may be enough to just keep you going for, for uh, ever until something else, until something non-aging kills uh, So yeah, so that's that's where aging is at, and it's, it's a huge piece. Um, and and um, but there is even bigger. So the second piece, enhancing our biological abilities. So, I'm assuming you guys have all heard of designer babies. Um, that's the most classic, you know, the, the cute baby with the, you know, the, the exact traits you want them. Um, 
The, the sort of three roughly categories of the biological enhancement. There's the pharmaceuticals, uh, which are most common and most known. There's the, um, I'll say the two, the third one is more on the antibiotic side. But, so, so either the genetic and epigenetic side or the pharmaceutical medication side. Um, and the interesting thing here is, is there is, uh, not only could we start uh, selecting traits for, for our children and, and deciding of um, what kind of you know, IQ they should have or what kind of, um, but um, you could also start doing things like um, tweaking um, their ethics. Um, and there's a whole new class of book on, on, the, on the left, uh, Unfit for the Future. And so it's making the case for what we call moral enhancement. Um, and it's that sense that as human beings, you know, we evolved to have this, you know, caveman psychology. Um, a lot of our ethics are questionable. A lot of our, you know, our impulses are irrational. Um, if there were drugs, if there were genetic tweaking that you could set in place to correct that, um, to make us more naturally rational, to make us more naturally, um, uh, yeah, just better people. Um, technically, you could go down that path. Uh, there are. A lot of philosophical questions around, for example, um, what is the right path to go down? Um, but from a practical standpoint of you know, reducing, for example, impulse decisions that lead to bad things, you could probably do go a long way. Uh, so, uh, what would uh, what would a world with biological enhancement look like? First off, um, there's a sense of you know, right now the limitation is the human being. And, you know, for example, think of like democracy. Um, there's a lot of talk about how, you know, if only we had first past the post, uh, sorry, if we had direct proportional representation instead of first past the post, if only we had, you know, a better system to run our society, if only we had, you know, better laws and that kind of stuff. And it's true that all those things, if you change the constitution, if you change you know, all the rules of how human beings interact, you can improve things. Um, but what if you change the human being itself? Um, what if you had you know, politicians who were genetically predisposed to being ethical? Um, what if you had voters who had higher IQs, more general interest in political issues? You know, if you really want to change the system, um, this is how you change it. Um, and there's, there's so much that we take for granted of but how, how the way the, the world works. Um, you know, things like the the prisoner's dilemma, how, how to get people to, to trust each other. Like all that stuff, if you start modifying the human being itself, all that becomes a variable you can mess with and 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 quote unquote solve. And that is, it's not like super obvious to think about it, but the impacts could be fundamental. Um, the other thing, so on, on the uh, second point, there's uh, fine tuned and on demand moods. So there's talk about the the happy pill, um, and you have to ask yourself because if you could take a happy pill, would you take one? Um, and there's a lot of questions around, like, you know, okay, so, so, like, um, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's psychedelics, but taking to the extreme in the sense that you can find and control your mood, um, you could very much live any experience you wanted by just, you know, like, you know, this pill now, this pill now, and one more pill to, to, you know, erase it all. Um, the experience of being alive could be very, very different, um, if you have that. Now, the, the bottom three pieces here, um, are, well, well, I guess second two here are, are the, the real risk with biological enhancements, and, and it comes down to, it's all very well to modify one person, but how does that impact everybody else? Uh, and, and specifically, so if you have, um, like right now, um, you know, the, realistically, you'll be the super wealthy who have access to either rejuvenation therapies or to, you know, designer babies or to all the rest first. Uh, and so you could very much have not only financial inequality, you know, the top 1%, you know, getting all the money, all the power politically, but on top of that, they could literally be, you know, um, enhancing their IQs beyond, significantly beyond everyone else. And you get this sort of spread of, you know, at some point, the, the at some point, just, you're no longer talking about homo sapiens, you're no longer about that, and, and for society to work, whether it be a democracy or any other, there has to be that sense that you're sort of, we're all in it together, we're all, you know, we're all humans, we're all, you know. Um, and if you don't have that, and you start getting real inequality, I mean, you could have some big problems. And, and so, for, for a practical example, Say, uh, say you know, you, you want your kids to be all natural. You're not going to go down to an acid bath. The right thing to do is to be stay human. Um, but your neighbors decide, you know what? Actually, they're going to give their kids a little bit of boost. Um, and so, you know, 18 years down the road, uh, they both apply to university. Um, 
which one is most likely to get in. Um, of course, you think you apply to a job and, and your parents didn't enhance you, or, or, or your competitors are taking pharmaceutical that's boosting your, your you know, uh, boosting energy. Um, there's a lot of these things where there's going to be a pressure to, to upgrade. Um, like once there's sort of a, a bit of an arm race going on where once everyone else is upgraded, well, you sort of have to upgrade, otherwise you'll be left behind. And that can happen between nation states, that can happen between companies, that can happen between neighbors um, or family members. Um, and with regards to what we call speciation, so that's the idea that you start getting different types of human beings. Uh, one of the aspects that you could change, for example, is you could, um, in theory, give yourself new senses. You know, so we, right now we have you know sight and smell and, and you know hearing and the rest, but it's possible there could be other forms of you know maybe you know detecting infrared or detecting other kinds of, of uh, you know waves, um, which is they're again great. Um, but if not everyone has that same ability, you you won't be able to share your experience of that new sense with everyone else. And there again is a sense of okay, how do you how do you communicate with others if, if they don't have the same lived experience as you? So there's a lot of like societal uh, turbulence that could come along with people starting to give them themselves. Now, on to end on, on a positive note, the you know we evolved on planet Earth. We are very much adapted to you know oxygen and water and, and you know a certain amount of gravity. Um, I don't know if you on that photo on the bottom, but you know, the guys in space don't look that comfortable. Um, and if at any point their mass breaks, they die pretty much instantly. There's a sense of if we really want to colonize other planets, um, and especially if we want to, you know, uh, travel 10,000 light years to another galaxy, we're probably going to have to modify how our biology works um, so that we can adapt to that and and and, and fit it. Um, so so that the, the, there are a lot of these huge possibilities um, and huge risks to go with this. Which brings us to the last, but certainly not least. Oh, sorry. Uh, where are things right right now? So, uh, designer babies exist already uh, to a certain extent. Right now, so since 2015, uh, in China they started, and I think they have it already in the US now as well. The, right now, if you're wealthy parents and you have a genetic disease, or say a, 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 a family history of a certain genetic type of disease, you can get the in vitro fertilization IVF have the have a lab take a look at the, the fertilized cell um, and uh, check your type, type of DNA, see if there are any genetic diseases, and with, thanks to CRISPR, they can actually remove that or, or alter that gene sequence to correct the, the DNA and then put it back and, and uh, put it back in the womb and then have it born. So we actually do have the technology for designer babies right now. Um, it is being used in a small sense in terms of removing um, genetic diseases. Um, the next step, you know, is, is, is the same technology pretty much to, 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 to go from there to tweaking one of those genes for IQ or tweaking one of those genes for, you know, for uh, number of things. However, the problem is, um, the, on the genetic side of things, so DNA is we call, we call, of course it's called spaghetti code. Basically it's a whole bundle of, um, it is code, but it's just a constant, like, it's, a, it's a almost nonsensical bundle of information that's been accumulated over a thousand mutations over, over billions of years. So uh, sometimes the same gene will be repeated five or six times in the same in, the, in our DNA. So, uh, sometimes the same gene will code for you know the size of your ear and the function of your liver and the size of your toe. Um, so you may find one to, you know, to cure your liver, but it will also impact your uh, toe of your ear. So it's, it's, it's very, very hard. There are very few cases where you can just take like one gene and Aha, uh -huh. you know, this, this will lose that key by 10 points. Um, so this will, uh, right now we're using AI to really crunch that data and try to find patterns and, and figure out, okay, how do we, how do we shape stuff? But uh, it's, it's a lot of work and we're still early on. So gene therapy is, uh, is when someone is already alive, fully grown, but they inject a virus into you to change your DNA. Um, and it's been, there's been lots of hype around it for like 20 years, but there's been a lot of failures as well. And, just, I think this year, um, they, the US, they approved the first gene therapy treatment. Um, it costs almost a million dollars, um, and um, it's, you're not guaranteed to see it uh, all that well. Um, so there's a sense of, you know, before it becomes mainstream, we have a long way to go. Where we are more advanced, though, um, is when it comes to pharmaceuticals, and a lot of this stuff won't surprise you, like, for example, 
physical enhancements. If you look at the Olympics, I mean, there's been an explosion in the amount of ways that you know athletes can can dope themselves. Uh, and it's going to continue because there's more and more. You know, as we discover more about the body, we can figure out more and more ways to, to boost ourselves. On the mental side, it's not as strong. Um, there's a thing called nootropics, which are um, basically herbs um, and, and various sort of light supplements that, that they do, there's some evidence of improving cognition, but it's, it's there isn't that much clinical evidence and it's not specifically missing. Stimulants like coffee or, or, or drugs like Adderall, um, they make it, so there, there's some, uh, but it's, it's uh, we seem to have uh, some background alarms. That's the alarm saying, oh, don't, don't do this, okay. <laughs> um, mood experience, there's psychedelics and there are antidepressants. And the interesting thing is, so some existing medications um, actually have an ethical boosting aspect. So uh, I think there's a blood pressure one that um, makes people less, um, that reduces people's ill feelings towards other races. Um, there are some um, contraceptives that, that, that boost uh, uh, oxytocin, which creates more empathy and more uh, trust. Um, and uh, antidepressants that do another thing. So there, there, are, there actually are some drugs right now that um, if we wanted to, we could say, okay, if you're a decision maker, you have to take this drug before making a decision because it'll ensure that you're you know, in a right uh, state of mind. So I think that antidepressants can, can reduce uh, violence. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's where biological enhancement is at right now. As you can see, there is still probably, you know, a, a, at least a decade before we start seeing real changes on, on some of those but you know, if we can make a breakthrough on, on figuring out what parts of the DNA code for what and then get better control of that, um, certainly the desire of these species is on, is near, you know, very close. Um, and pharmaceuticals are not going to, you know, get any weaker anytime soon. So um, we're on the road, um, but there's a little while yet. Which brings us to our last piece, which is the uh, most sci fi ish um, and also the potentially the most impactful, it's really hard to, to this one is supposed to be hard to wrap your head around sometimes. <coughs> so merging with machines, that's both bionics, like, you know, or prosthetics, like an arm, um, or, or uh, looking at, um, okay. um, so they're, they're yeah, prosthetics, uh, they're, in 2018 they recently uh, approved a artificial pancreas, um, diabetics, um, and, um, and, the, and the most common, or the, most, the oldest one existing is one the photo on the left, is the cochlear implant where they have a, it's an ear device, they also like a drill into, in, uh, into the skull, um, a little electrodes, and, and the brain is able to um, wrap, wrap itself around those electrodes and, and read the signal to help people out here. So uh, that's the, the latest with the uh, Yeah, okay, so this is a, Okay, so I'm going to show a short video here. Um, the whole thing, but um, okay, this is not okay. Um, that's okay. It's not. It's not super important um, to get sound. Basically, this is this is where. Um, so that, that's one of the older versions um, of, of current prosthetic. The limitation with those prosthetics uh, and with the frontier right now is is the getting sensory feedback. Because apparently it's really hard to like pull onto things and, and find control things um, um, when you can't do that. But however, in terms of move, movements and strength, um, it was part of the video where she was using a, a uh, bow and arrow. Um, and uh, now those prosthetics I think cost around like twenty thousand dollars a piece. Um, but there's also some um, some uh, cheaper versions, uh, thanks to technologies like 3D printing. Um, and so what this family is doing is they're actually 3D printing their own um, devices. Not quite as high tech, um, but um, as you can see, the kid can still uh, close his, you know, his fingers and, and, and uh, get some basic movement in, which, um, you know, it's, it's pretty, Already pretty sci-fi, given the. Um, I don't know. So that's where that's like, this is like the video from from this year. So. So.
Um, okay, so yeah, so so what a, a, a sorry, before we go there, there's one more piece which um, I didn't talk about, and that's the idea of in the long run. There's a talk about uh, whole brain emulation for mind uploading, um, and there's a sense of if you could take your brain uh, and put the contents onto a computer, um, so basically run your, your brain like a piece of software. Um, there's a huge technical question mark around this if it's even possible, because the, it may be that the, the human brain and human cognition is dependent on a biological substrate. Um, but there is a lot of hype and a lot of hope around uh, what we call like whole brain emulations, um, which is the idea that if you have, you know, basically you can live on the internet as a piece of software, um, and that would enable things like thinking much, much faster because the electronic speeds are like 10,000 times faster than chemical speeds, so everything you do, you get a PhD in a few hours or whatever it was, a few days. Um, so there's a lot of uh, hype around that. Um, there's also a it's at that point where you start merging discussions around general artificial intelligence, where um, you have basically where, where software, you get a super intelligent piece of software, um, and there also the, the implications of that are, are, are uh, very, very wide ranging. So what would that role look like? Um, so if we can get to the point where we have, um, for example, an interface, a direct interface with computers, and we get to the point where we can think you know, and have access directly to not only the world's information, but also to, to say, uh, computing, you know, so, so for example, you want to calculate a large number, you wouldn't have to do it inside your brain, you'd have access to, uh, um, you know, modules, uh, or, or electronic modules, they could just, you know, calculate for you, and you sort of attention to your thoughts. Um, there, with that kind of thing, you could really significantly boost human intelligence by factors of, you know, 10, 100, 10,000 times. Uh, which is a lot more than you could biologically. Um, so th there's that sense of this is like the really, really, really game changer stuff is, is on this side. Um, physically, obviously, you know, if you're, if you attach yourself to, uh, give yourself like a bionic uh, automobile, just, you know, you can, you can go very fast and very far. Um, that part is, is pretty obvious. We're seeing with a lot of the competitions in the Olympics, or sorry, the Paralympics, where the, um, uh, you actually, people who, who don't have legs can actually be faster than people who do because the, the way the design of the artificial limbs are, they can run faster with them. So, the other thing is, okay, if you could really interface with the brain and get like, you know, brain computer uh, communication, uh, imagine, you, you know, imagine you might want to explain something to someone, you would just share your thoughts literally with that person. Um, you know, a lot of the time right now we talk about how you know, if you talk, if you say something to someone, they're only receiving about ten percent of that message, um, or what you say is only ten percent of what they remember. Um, well, in this case, you literally get hundred percent or ninety-nine percent fidelity of exactly what you're trying to say, um, and you can have far more, you know, uh, deeper, more empathetic experiences uh, because you're you could literally feel what that other person is feeling um, if you can get into an electronic format and share that format with your brain. So there's a lot of these sort of these um, science fiction-y sounding situations, uh, which uh, right now are very much science fiction, but but is is there again within the laws of physics? There's, not, there's no law. There's nothing that would in theory stop this from being possible. Now the downside of this, of course, is that if you are if you're is fully integrated with the internet, um, someone could hack into it um, and rewrite the contents of your brain. Um, on the physical side, I mean already. There's a cybersecurity scare of people who have pacemakers because the um, I think someone proved uh, proof of concept proved that they could hack into the pacemaker's uh, module and, and reprogram the heartbeat. So um, if you have a pacemaker, make sure you have the latest patch of software because that could be you know um, you could really be, you could really mess with people with this um, um, and, and you know whole things like mind crimes and much other stuff. Existential risk. So this is more along the lines of um, super intelligence. So if you have a human being that is whose intelligence is boosted to a factor of a million, is there any guarantee that you can trust that uh, that that being, which happens to be able to, you know, if there's only one person, for example, the first person to become super super smart, um, if for whatever reason their brain is out of whack in other ways and they misuse that ability, um, you could get situations where you have you know, global catastrophe. 
Um, here again, it's very, these are possibilities, not to guarantees, but it is the things that are, that are on the horizon. Um, and basically, the more power you have, obviously, the more danger it is. Um, and, and as we merge with machines, especially on the, on the neurological side, there is a lot more things to happen. But, um, on a positive side, if you really want to talk about immortality, um, then you have to go, probably have to go electronic. Um, the reason is, so biologically, as I mentioned with aging, you can, you know, you can fix the human body, um, but if you, you know, if, if someone rolls over you with a steamroller, realistically, it's, it's the end, you're still going to die. I mean, they're not going to really innovate to save you, um, even with chronic stuff like that. Um, but if your brain is on a piece of software um, that you can copy a million times over on various planets, then you can really talk about, you know, quote, unquote, living forever. Uh, so, uh, you could want to live forever too, but, but it is, at least in terms of, this could be a very possible. So, where are things at? Uh, so, so uh, but as I mentioned in the video, this is where bionics are at. So, that's the fake uh, pancreas. Um, then you have the uh, prosthetic limbs. The neurotechnology side has a long way to go. Um, so this you can actually buy on Amazon now. It's a little device you put on your kid's head, um, and it's supposed to give them feedback as to where their mental state is and help them like, do mental exercises. Um, this is pretty crude. Basically what that device is, it's a, what they call a EEG, a electroencephalogram. Um, and what happens is, so your brain, all your neurons are, as they, as they fire, they emit small electromagnetic waves. Um, and those waves uh, can or, or can be measured basically um, at a mass scale. So, what the device is doing there is it's, it's reading all of the, the, the sum of all of those uh, waves and it, it looking at a general picture and using AI to try to figure out okay, so what does that mean? Um, they can't really derive much information from it yet. Um, mostly, it helps for things like meditation, where they can say okay, well, your brain's active or your brain's not active, um, or there are certain like characteristics of patterns, like overall patterns, but. Uh, they can't use that to read your thoughts, um, other than maybe in a statistical sense of you are thinking or you're not thinking. Um, uh, so this is I mean, this is pretty still pretty rudimentary. Where, where it gets more interesting and more powerful is the intracranial stuff, where they uh, drill a hole into your head and put an electrode directly into your into your brain, uh, which sounds terrible, but actually has many benefits, especially for those who are paraplegic, for those who have some um, loss of function. Um, there have been situations where people who were able to drive a wheelchair just with their thoughts, or, or type stuff just with their thoughts, thanks to technology like that. But of course, it involves you know drilling something into your head, which um, has a lot of risk. Not for everyone. Um, probably not going to go mainstream too, too soon. Um, and, and the real challenge is uh, in both those situations is that there's no there's no USB plug for the brain. Um, uh, to to really interface with the brain fully, you need to have simultaneous um, access to every neuron in the brain and have a way to both read that information and alter that information. Um, and at our current rates, uh, in terms of our, um, like where things are at, we've been slowly increasing the, 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 the size of the interface of the brain, getting smaller and smaller electrodes, getting more and more fine-tuned, but it would still take, at current rates, I think it's 30 to up to 70 years before they can get all the neurons in the brain um, to, to connect to a computer. So, Fortunately or unfortunately, the neurotechnology side, the merging with machines, eventually is the furthest off. So, uh, some final thoughts on um, human enhancements. Um, the first one, and this is sort of the gross part, which is that uh, you know, medicine and any science is messy. You have to try stuff and it fails. Um, there may be you know the designer babies that you want to give an IQ boost and you actually get, accidentally give them schizophrenia. Um, or the, the kids you want to give, a, I don't know, like a, a super athlete and they grow a third leg, or you know. But if you go down that path, it's going to take a lot of, of uh, real soul searching from ethical standpoints and, and, and a willingness to put up with uh, individual suffering for a greater cause if we believe that greater cause would be worth it. Um, and the other thing is, you know, this is a brand new character. We have no idea how this is going to play out. Um, there are a lot of unknown unknowns. There could be huge risks we're not aware of. There could also be huge benefits we're not aware of. Um, uh, I think even if we started, for example, improving decision making by 20% with some basic drugs, you know, if you, if you multiply that by all the decisions everyone makes across the world, um, you could have some pretty phenomenally positive results. Um, um, and as I mentioned before, also there could be a lot of really negative results too. So 
that is the sort of the what can we do part of this presentation. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll move on to the second part and then we can uh, um, have a lot of our discussion. And, and, uh, and if anything is unclear, uh, if you have questions now, you can raise your hand and let me know. So part two, what should we do? Uh, what are the options we have? And um, the key arguments that have been brought up so far to, to embrace or not embrace the technology. So before we even do that, though, there, there is uh, some context to be had. Um, now, I, I, I need to introduce myself. Okay, so my name is uh, Wyatt Vissari. I, I spent the last, I was heavily involved in, in uh, the climate change movement until 2015. And then I came across readings on, on AI and other technologies, and so I realized actually climate change may not be the biggest issue. And so I spent the last two or three years uh, researching a wide range of topics, everything from like you know populism to cybersecurity to migration to uh, a whole bunch of stuff. Just to get a sense of okay, so what, what is going on in advancing things, what matters. Um, and so after the, those two years of research, this is what I, the conclusion I came to. In terms of the issues that on their own could change our life most fundamentally and change our long-term future, um, these are the ones that, that really pop to mind. So on the bottom you have the really big issues like war or recessions or terrorism um, that come and go, uh, that we've been through before, um, that we probably can go through again. A level above that are the, the fundamental lifestyle changes that are happening in terms of, for example, automation and the end of jobs. Um, the abundance, um, um, the you know digital age, big data, and all that kind of stuff, and then there's the whole virtual reality, you know, um, being part of this world or not. Um, so that's what the lifestyle change, but that doesn't change. Those, that level doesn't change our sort of survival necessarily. Um, the level above that, catastrophic risk could. Uh, these are risks that could bring down modern civilization. So a big enough nuclear war, if climate change gets bad enough, um, if there's an engineer pandemic, or if there's other or other like a big enough asteroid, there, there could be events which you know could wipe out billions, and that would be a huge, huge deal. But even those bottom three issues, which would be you know a big enough century for any time, aren't the biggest issue. I think human enhancement, uh, which we're talking about today, is the bigger than that, mainly because you know when you start changing a human being, um, everything else changes. Um, everything else becomes possible, um, and and especially when you start getting boosting the, the the cognitive abilities, it just opens up the whole new world. And then tied to that, and perhaps separate, perhaps tied, is uh, artificial general intelligence, and that's uh, smarter than human AI, even if it's not conscious, even if it's not, you know, you don't have to think of a Terminator, just think of a really powerful calculator that can solve any solution you ask it to. Um, having that ability um, means that we could solve climate, means that we could solve all the other issues below that. So this is why I think um, this is where, or I think of the, of the 21st century, um, and when it comes to human enhancement, when we're talking about you know, what should we do, we have to remember a few things. Um, on the AI side, we don't know if we'll reach super intelligence through human enhancement or through um, pure AI first. There are those who say that it's actually more likely we'll get AGI um, within the next 20 or 30 years, which would make the whole you know, design of things kind of moot because that's, by the time that plays out, it's already past that. And AGI, if it, if it is up and running and working well, um, we could use that to manage our own evolution. Um, and it could, it could do things like simulate uh, impacts and, and guide us as to, you know, as to what kinds of modifications we should make to ourselves. In terms of the catastrophic risk, I mean, uh, human enhancement has, has a link there in terms of, uh, you know, smarter human beings, they're able to make decisions, more rational human beings could, you know, deal with things like climate change much better. Um, and also, I mean, keep in mind, with the automation and, and, and uh, new economics piece, you know, if, if we have a whole bunch of free time on our hands because we don't have any work, that also gives us more time to think with these issues, it gives us more time to want to play with these issues. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of big things happening at the same time that, that you, you sort of have to keep it all in mind to get your idea to decide what's the best path. Um, and of course, things like war, I mean, if there is a you know, major war, you can be sure that the um, various militaries will be um, boosting their soldiers as much as possible um, to, to win and to get the best results. And already there's a lot of the, the military technology around human enhancement is, is both fascinating and, and terrifying. Um, there's a lot of like headsets that, that, that are designed to increase, um, like to maintain 
focus for hours on end, that kind of stuff. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, so human enhancement is a huge, huge piece in the big century. Um, and when we decide, like, what should we do about it, we have to keep in mind all the rest, which is really tough. There's this other question of, is the technology inevitable? I mean, what can we even stop it? Because we're going to talk about this, it's going to happen anyways. Um, and it's true that, um, um, it is, I mean, there's certainly you're not going to stop change, um, and you're not going to stop technology advancing in general. Um, so things like, um, yeah, for the breakthroughs, someone somewhere is going to make a, a, an advancement. And of course, there's a, a there's a new movement uh, called garage biology, where people who are literally in their garages using technologies like CRISPR to, to, to make new organisms and to just to, to themselves. So. That will be both a huge, huge boom in terms of you know new ideas, uh, new solutions, and also a big, huge risk. Um, but just the, the illustration there is that I mean, there, there are thousands and well, thousands of people working on this, and it'd be very, very difficult to stop all of them. Uh, yeah. So what's it called? Garage biology. Um, yeah. So it's sort of like a little bit like the Silicon Valley thing of you know starting your own company in, in the software company. This is like starting your own biotech company in your garage, uh, and because the tools are becoming more accessible, you can get stuff off Amazon or off eBay or. Um, the, uh, yeah. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, you know, at the very start, um, Homo sapiens has been evolving constantly for the last few centuries and decades. Um, so there's a sense of, um, you know, we're, we're not a static species and we know we're be. However, what we can do is uh, shape it. So things like we can definitely invest in oversight, um, we can definitely invest in, in coordination, and uh, for example, these, these individuals who, who are experimenting in, in garages, uh, we can reach out to them and, and at the very least, you know, provide <coughs> safety educational materials. Uh, I know the, the their FBI is keeping a close eye on, on a lot of these activities because they're aware that, you know, you can build a pathogen this way. Um, you can definitely educate and engage people. Um, the more people who are aware of these issues and, and can have the understanding to be able to Debate them effectively um, is, is another you know step in the right direction. On the inequality piece, it's a big one. I mean, you make sure that everyone has access to Xanadu and not just the super wealthy. And things like regulate or make a difference. Um, and of course, um, as difficult as getting global agreements is, uh, they do have some impact. Sometimes it's not a very strong impact, but you know every step in the right direction could mean you know one less catastrophe or one more big success. So, uh, and this is, I guess, is, is, well, it's my own philosophy, but I, I think it's, it's something that, you know, when we are historians about all these things happening in the century, like in the grand scheme of things, what really matters? You know, is, is, is maintaining homo sapiens uh, um, um, the same, or what, what, like, and I think when it comes down to it, um, the lowest common denominator across all human beings and across all species is, um, no one wants to see life end with no legacy. I think you know everyone dying and just the universe going cold. I think is one thing that pretty much everyone can agree is, is not good. Um, even if you hate the human species and you want the rest of life to succeed, um, there's a sense of, of you know, yeah, you, you want human beings to survive. And the other piece here is, so so the Earth has been around for four billion years, um, and as the sun expands and gets warmer. Um, what I understand is only about 400 million years left before it uh, absorbs on Earth. So, if we go extinct, um, and and by lack of luck, there is another intelligent species after us relatively quickly. Um, essentially, life could end. Life on Earth could end with us. Um, so that's one more reason why you can't just say, well, you know, let's let human beings die off and end. You know, um, we'll let you know life life go back to nature and all be good. Um, we're pretty much life's best bet in terms of getting off this planet. So there's a sense of in the grand scheme of things, if not Homo sapiens being alive, we have to find some kind of intelligent species to carry on uh, life. Beyond that, um, there's obviously things like you know, be nice to actually live nice lives, not be you know stuck in some form of suffering, um, and of course, also be nice to continue to evolve and not get stuck at a certain level of, of advancements. Um, but I think so. So I mean, when when thinking about what should be human enhancement, it's like what really matters. Um, 
I, I bring this up because some of the arguments for for human enhancement are precisely around um, around this. So here, are, um, I'll bring them up and discuss them in discussion period afterwards. But just the sort of top arguments. So to embrace human enhancements, um, we've always been a work in progress. We've always been uh, at risk. Um, there was never a point in human history or in the history of life in the universe where it couldn't have all ended. You know, if, if a big enough asteroid or comet had hit planet Earth, you know, two billion years ago, um, it was all over. Um, and and uh, there's a sense of, you know, there's no like safe option. We can just, you know, stay human and be okay. He's staying human is no guarantee of anything. Um, and also, you know, stopping us may be backfire as well. Um, we are. Last story was a little thing. Last is, is we are less and less adapted to environments. So, you know, we, most of our DNA is still geared towards life in a cave. You know, life as a hunter gatherer. Uh, you know, we, we're not necessarily the best. You know, there are a lot of good reasons to want to upgrade our hardware to to be better suited to, to the challenges of like complexity and speed that we have today. Um, and of course, back to that point around survival. I mean. We may not have the choice but to enhance simply because that may be the only route to survive. However, there are also some very strong arguments on the limit side. Um, you know, we, we already live in a very disorienting century, um, and, and do we really want to change the one thing that we count that we're on? Um, you know, the, 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 the chaos around, uh, you know, Try trying to figure out what to do. If, if, you don't, if, if as humans and our current morality, like at the end of the day, our, our current morality is all we have, um, and we start changing that, like what do we have? Um, then there's the what they call the bootstrapping problem, which is that, okay, so say we're flawed and we want to improve ourselves. Well, um, guess who's doing the improvement? You know, um, any morality issues we have will get passed on, likely into our, you know, progeny, uh, simply because we're we're not, you know. We are not perfect beings, and we cannot design a perfect system or another perfect being. Um, now, there's a lot of comments about this. Thanks for bearing with me. We'll get to question uh, soon. So, um, experimentation to the ethical side of okay, do we really want to put you know a whole bunch of people through a whole bunch of pain to get this uh, this atom? Um, and then there's the the catastrophic risk of if you add you know we're already drowning in complexity and speed. If you add a whole new layer of social confusion and of disorientation and of social conflicts um, and of, of dynamics that we're not used to, um, you know, that may be too much. You know, we may not be able to cope with that and, and that could cause collapse, that could cause, you know, um, uh, if not existential risk, at least catastrophic risk and, and you know, um, that is a, a strong counterpoint to, to assuming that if we boost ourselves we'll be better off in terms of thriving. So that's, these are roughly the kinds of discussions we're having, and I really, at some point uh, next year, I want to have a, like a proper debate with speakers, de de delving into these arguments and really starting them apart, and, and, and getting a, a um, you know a real sense of what what is the debate about when we talk about you know so what should we do about human enhancement. Last slide, we get to, to discussion. So um, I think at the very least um, we could start with a little hanging fruit. Um, you know, you could probably boost your IQ by 10 points just by sleeping properly, eating properly, and meditating, and doing other things like that to, to you know, get your brain uh, as good a state as possible. Um, there are, you know, I, I do think though we will have to have the courage to experiment, um, and uh, that will mean, you know, um, accepting some suffering of some individuals for a greater cause, um, and hopefully we can compensate those individuals and. Um, honor their sacrifice um, if it does come to that. Um, but I also think we should be, even as much as possible, quarantining these effects so we're not, you know, um, say trying out uh, a new drug and then just letting the same have the society. Like, you can try to test it in small groups and, and, and before, try to root out the worst of the side effects before it goes global. I also think so in terms of, and this is sort of a parallel to the, there's a whole debate around AI safety and making sure that the general AI is, is, is safe before it's powerful. Um, I think the same thing applies to human genes. Uh, we, I think we should be looking at, you know, boosting our rationality, boosting our ethics, um, and, and um, mindfulness, I think, before we start giving ourselves um, higher IQ. Um, and this is, I mean, this is still very theoretical because we don't have the technology for either right now in a strong way, but 
yeah. we can do a lot more research, for example, into the, the former versus the latter. I think that's, there again, something you can do the practical level that will increase the odds that it will turn out well. Uh, and finally, and, and what, you know, part of the purpose of tonight, um, you know, get the dialogue going, you get people talking, get, get you know, uh, the more we talk about this, the more we think about this, likely the better decision we'll come to. So, um, and, and it really has to be global because you can't have, you know, one nation project ahead of us and leave else behind. Um, there's a lot of like, global issues we talk about together, but I think this is one where we really have to sit down as a species and sort of figure out, okay, so how do we at least limit the worst success, the worst uh, side effects of, of being, um, uh, yeah, of, of change results. So, with all that said, um, to start off the Q&A, um, Phil, if you want to come up and, and, and uh, ask any questions you think, and then and, uh, move it up to the floor, or say whatever you want to say to, to uh, add to the conversation. Sure. I didn't actually know I was going to talk today, but um, <laughs> thanks a lot for a good presentation. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I really want to get the discussion going. Um, I think obviously this topic is something that is not just in terms of what scientists stands. It's really something that we, is potentially affecting the future of all humans. So this really involves all of us, and we should really start thinking about what types of value frameworks we're using to think about how we make these decisions in the future. So actually, I have a question for you about the mind. Okay. So, so you work in, in biotech, right? I guess. Okay. So in, in that industry, how many people would be talking about this kind of topic, uh, if at all? Um, how many do you wear? I mean, like, there are rules like that. One in ten, one in five in ten. Like, um, even for those who are most aware of what they know that today, like, how much of it, yeah? I mean, I, I think everybody's thinking about the ethical questions. Um, I would just add a conference talk about specific aging. And I think the interesting stuff around longevity and aging is actually starting to really uh, pick up steam. The number of conferences that are popping up around the world talking about this stuff, um, the number of people coming to these conferences as well. Um, there's a lot of exciting things that are happening. And it's really because the science is really picking up. Uh, I can give you some examples specifically. So uh, I know why I talked about Aubrey de Grey, who came up with this like framework around how we're going to basically reverse aging, probably maybe 10 years ago. Um, exciting news is he, he basically broke it down to, I think, seven problems. One of the first problems is about to get solved and is basically going through clinical trials right now. Um, it's called for senescent cells. So basically, there's these cells that don't die in your body, and then they end up excreting bad things. Um, and then the neighboring cells also end up not dying. And slowly over time, these type of cells build. In mice, they've been shown to, by removing these cells, reduce, uh, it, I'm sorry, extend human lifespan by 36%. Sorry. Extend mice uh, lifespan by 36%. Um, and we're, there are already about five different uh, therapies that are targeting this right now in phase two, phase three trials. You should see a lot of these things available in the next five years. And there are some off the shelf things available right now if you really want to use them. Um, so these are the type of signs that people are starting to see as we have more and more signs showing that in mice, in other models, that this is actually going to uh, extend human health span. Um, to really get people excited about this. So there's it's, it's a sense of like it's, it's, it's starting to happen, that really is like where the, where there was a science fiction for a long time, and I was like, it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, Any other thoughts for you before, or? Uh? Yeah, sure. Um, how, how many of you guys know what IVF is? How about? In vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization. Uh, in vitro? Yeah, yeah. Okay. For a few decades. So, 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 I mean, I, I think the aging stuff has, people have been able to start working on it for about maybe, let's say, maybe 10 years. Uh, for the human enhancement or uh, the biological enhancement? Biological enhancement. I think people can probably start working on it in the next like two to five years. Yeah. And then the, the, like, the brain merging stuff is probably like 10 years out, potentially. 
just putting time frames on it from where I'm sitting. Um, for, from your side, I wanted to pose a question to you in terms of, because for the, for, the, for the stuff around, uh, I guess, enhancing and designing babies, a lot of that stuff, technology is available right now, right? So IVF, essentially, you're able to take these, uh, <laughs> able to create these babies outside of the womb, and then you can screen them, and then you can also put them back. Um, and there is CRISPR now that is able to switch things off. So I guess I want to pose a question to, to everybody up here. Um, let's say that you and your partner are going to plan on having a baby, and both of you um, might have like susceptibility to a disease. Right? So, it's, so your baby basically has 25% chance that they might actually get something. Would you go down the normal route of conceiving and then having a child. So that's option one. The second option would be conceiving, or sorry, giving, conceiving it normally, but then testing it, seeing if it has a disease, and then um, figuring out whether you want to abort or not. Or the third one is going down this IVF route, potentially screening, figuring out one of your potential 10, and knowing that it's not gonna get uh, any sort of disease, and then implant it. Um, so, so this being two and three, that um, they both are, are you stop before you have the... Uh, no, so the, the first one is you don't stop. Yeah, you actually, yeah, you actually yeah. get birth to the baby. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, how many people would choose option number one? Okay, so the traditional, straightforward birth yeah. Okay, how many people would choose option number two? So the screening, but not modification. Okay. Yes, but not modification. And then number three. Yeah, I see this. This is a this is a right. futurist crowd. Yeah, yeah. well, it depends on the crowd, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but it's. I mean, any medication you try, you go through a clinical trials. So the yeah. presumption is, by the time this would be available for a layman to use, it would have gone through various clinical trials. So there would be data sufficient prove that it actually works without any side effects. Well, I'm saying it's already it's already yeah. it's already it's already doable right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 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 the body of evidence is still limited because you've not had sufficient number of cases where this has been done and they've lived 10, 20, 30 years to see whether it's oh, actually led to any different side effects coming from now from some of those. Sorry, sorry. Right now, you can already get your, through IVF, get a baby created outside. You can. You what can. I'm saying is you've okay. not had baby that was born 30 years back with this Okay, yeah, so you, be so effects, you don't know whether the side yeah, effects will manifest in 10, 20, 30 years. I would say from an IVF perspective, there's already like a million IVF babies yeah. getting born every single year. Yeah, I mean, for the sake, this is the first person I've had that they will change. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like this is already a yeah. huge amount of cycles happening already. Yeah. Um, that, and generally viewed as safe by now. Yeah. The, the CRISPR stuff is slightly different. There's other, other yeah. Things that um, other science that needs to prove that. Up. Well, and so, I guess the question for everyone would be: So, so um, raise your hand if, if the technology was there, for example, to give your kids uh, a significant IQ boost or some other trait you thought was desirable. Raise your hand if you think uh, if you'd be willing to have your kid be boosted in some way. Um, okay. So, I yeah. want. Yeah. Think about uh, genetic modification that wasn't talked about was the, uh, the loss of genetic variation. The ideal yes. optimum genetic makeup right now may not be the one that's five, ten years from now, or even forget about fifty years from now. And in different conditions, different genetic makeups are the right one. So we lose it if we everyone's competing for optimum right now. Uh, so there could be like fads in terms of, you know, everyone wants a certain type of hair color or a certain type of, and suddenly you get the population is much less diverse than it would have otherwise. It could, uh, the, the tricky thing with that is that it could go both ways, right? Because the technology is there to, to both uh, have everyone do the same thing, but also have everyone try something else, you could get a lot of diversity from sort of more like if your parents who want their kids to be like have a little cool in some way, like have a third arm or something, or, you know. So you could get some like, so, you know, um, there is a, there is room for like more diversity than normal or at least diversity to be outside the, the usual spectrum of, of um, but certainly yeah, there is a turnaround uh, like 
especially in the early stages where there aren't that many proven like enhancements, um, and you know that you know you can get a pretty solid um, uh, evidence that so you can get a 10 percent IQ boost with one gene change, and it's open available. Yeah, everyone will. Yeah. So. I mean, I think there's definitely like argument for saying that we're reducing, um, I guess, genetic variability by taking out potential diseases. That's like the first thing that we probably screen for, uh, really reducing the amount of like patients or babies born with Down syndrome. And now you're taking that out of the kind of gene pool. I do think there's the other side that if you were able to actually change your genes in some way, that you as an individual be able to I will be able to choose that I have. I want um, five arms, and from that side, that like that genetic diversity will increase on that side, right? Um, and depending on that, we'll have to be way more accepting of different diversity of our people. In my opinion, this, this is what their individual choice is. Yeah. Yeah. So, questions that about this comes to just goes into what you say. Um, so it just goes up to what you say uh, in, in, on your page. Uh, when, do we call, when do we stop calling ourselves humans? Yeah. I think uh, and that's very interesting because uh, then we start uh, to really uh, get into like, you know, differences in there. Yeah, I like the yeah. 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 No, that was a good question. question. And, and that uh, I'm personally hoping we can keep a very wide definition of any, any sort of sentient intelligent being. And, and, you know, in the same way we opened up our, our, our we went from being very tribal to more global um, in general. Um, I'm hoping that will also apply to um, human beings, and also look at human beings or think exactly like human beings. Um, but yeah, yeah, I was just touching on the yeah. same point. Um, you know, at what point if we eliminate all of our flaws, like we lose our humanity? And in doing so, you mentioned, okay, we have this sort of pill that can provide us with more empathy. But do we not as humans to get our empathy from dealing with, like socially dealing with people that have flaws, so are we not, you know, causing a lack of empathy by eliminating our flaws? I'm curious to hear, like, where the humanity Yeah, ends. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, the, the, uh, so, so, yes, um, I, I know, I mean, it really comes, at that point, it, it, it's more a question about ethics and about, about um, you know, what it is to live a meaningful life kind of stuff than it is about the technologies per se, because the, um, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're strictly utilitarian and you want to, like, basically okay, so have a situation where you want uh, more empathy for the sake of, you know, their societal, you know, um, well-being, um, then, yeah, you say just take a drug. But, but, I mean, in terms of, uh, that's also a short-term solution. And, and, and if we get the, I mean, ideally, um, human beings would, would um, take that time to actually um, work on their empathy um, and, and go through that process, you know. But, but I guess there's a real sense of, of uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to answer that because it's, it's such an ethical based uh, yeah. um, study. Pattern of data, yeah, a dynamic pattern of data. 
Um, and and uh, yes, you saw a coordination strategy that would be, um, I mean, there's some, some te technical aspects of can you replicate that pattern in a software as a, with high enough fidelity to actually be the real thing. Um, like even, for example, with, you know, a, 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 like vinyl, for example, music, there's a lot of talk about, you know, vinyl, vinyl sound versus uh, CD sound, whereas the CD is, is a bunch of ones and zeros that is approximated to look like a wave, um, whereas vinyl is the actual wave. Um, so this is that, um, when it comes to like human beings being uploaded to the internet, um, to analog or digital, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, Essentially, from a from a yes, the technical answer is yes. Um, from a how do we live our life, how do we want to see the world, how do we want to track the world question, um, I think it's not the most empowering way to look at the world. But um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. Well, I guess depends on your viewpoint. Yeah. Why do you think it's empowering? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it feels very reductionist to just think we're we're you know a bunch of ones and zeros. Um, it really cool about a bunch of ones and zeros, and you know. Um, I, I, you know, I tend to be, in terms of the free will versus the determinism side, very much on the heart of determinism, like we are a mass of atoms subject to the laws of physics, um, more or less. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't spend my days thinking about that because it doesn't make me feel powerful. So, or well, in my thoughts. Yeah, so far we have focused mostly on the positive aspects, right? Like, we will upgrade ourselves, we will integrate with machines, yeah. genetic engineering, increase the IQ, but I am actually terrified about the future. I'm so extremely so biased. Yeah, yeah. So we will end up at one point with, let's say, eight or nine billion people. While all the blue color jobs are gone, most of the white color jobs are gone. Okay, there are jobs for IT coders, developers, but some of that will be gone as well because the software will be self-coding as well. So that will be, a, if you plot on the graphic, a breakthrough point where there's huge population, nearly zero jobs. What the hell are we going to do with all those people? <laughs> well, so, so this is a very good, uh, when I talk one of those slides that I talk about, a fundamental shift in values and where we live. I think for it to work, uh, we really have to rethink what it means to be, to live a meaningful life. And I think um, there's a, Eagle Harari had a good piece on this around, I uh, looked at, at, at populations that don't work, um, that don't be any productive, but are very, very happy and very, very fulfilled. Um, and there are examples, for example, the, the, uh, the ultra Orthodox Jewish men in, in Israel, where they spend their entire time uh, focused on, on biblical texts and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but they do it with such focus and with such passion, there's a whole community around it, um, that it's, it's, they live, you know, they become they, themselves very, very happy and they really like that. And so I think, you know, as, as we look at, as we go into the future, yeah, I mean, 20 years from now, we may not have a job, but we can still be living very good lives, if not better lives, uh, doing things that we love doing, even though it's no longer a job, it's just like you can no longer make money off of it. Um, you can still, if you have a passion for art, if you have a passion for sport, that kind of stuff, that there's a, um, like in terms of our, 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 what we value in life, I think, as long as we can update our values uh, as, with the position around us, I think we have a chance. But there's also a whole bunch of political, economical, structural stuff that's changed, like making it possible to live without income, uh, or making it possible to... So, I agree with you, I mean, I, 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 I focus a lot on positive just because it's, 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 um, it's a coping mechanism to deal with all the scary shit as well. But, um, um, yeah, I think, I mean, a, a, a beautiful future is possible. It'll just take a heck of a lot of work and, and a lot of navigation, um, so yeah. So what I'm understanding is you have a fear of, uh, I think it's the future and automation and robots really taking over a lot of our jobs. Um, I, I haven't thought about this too much. I, I, I do know that we, we had the same concerns like in, in the 80s as well. Um, but sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, I, I can sense what's coming. So let yeah. me make it more specific, right? Okay, there might be a point where people won't need to work and there's universal income yeah. and everything. They will just write poems and sing songs yeah. and everything nice, but there will be a period in the next 30 years where, like, what I'm going to do with 300 million the transition. Yeah. yeah, working in the dark mines and not know anything else. Yeah. But, and you cannot compare it to the past where you say, oh, before the let's say printing press, the manual writing, they should that, 
will be a different story. Right. So I just want to make it even more difficult for you. So I haven't looked into this too deeply, but why, why, why do you think it's a different story? Well, just because we're going off topic on, on sure. the answer. Does anyone else have questions that they want to fit in? Uh, or if, if not, so we can continue this. I just, just want to make sure that we're not. I think we have to change the ground. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. Just yeah. like, yeah, everyone's ready to do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, I mean, there's a whole it's, other it's event. It's very brief. It's very brief. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Um, at some point, I'll put together a whole event just on automation because it's a huge, sure. really important topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe we just have to change our. our the, the, the human race has to self sustain itself, is what it is. I, I think uh, uh, they have to, we have to bring each other up. See, uh, some parts of the countries of the world has technology versus the other parts, and that's what makes other countries uh, sort of less efficient than, than the rest. But that's when we have to step in and sort of build an economy. Uh, what can we do? What can we change? And how can we integrate them into what we're doing? Because I think a lot of the successful uh, places are the ones that have learned how to. Uh, exist and cohabitate with each other. I mean, that's what really defines me. So that was, I don't think you have anything to worry about, man. <laughs> like, we're, we're Thank really you. Thank 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 you. This is why the reason inequality exists is because it's the direct uh, outcome of the basic tenet of evolution, which is how the fittest. And you cannot have a fittest with it if everyone is equal. So um, I think inequality is something that is always going to be around and it's not going to go away. Um, and if, think, if efforts are made to make everyone equal, then there will be equal, then opposite as efforts made to create inequality in some ways. Yeah. That's a good point, yeah. Which yeah. question? Well, the contention is that today, if there's a difference between Jeff Bezos and some random guy on the street, all it could take is a couple of generations of good luck and good hard work and some engraving attitude that he could become Jeff Bezos. But if you go down that path of genetic modification, genetic enhancement, the gulf between the haves and have nots in terms of ability to change to such a degree that no matter how enterprising and lucky you are, you may not bridge that gulf. So today you can bridge that gulf over a couple of generations, a generation of enterprise hard work luck. But with biological enhancements, the gulf may be like many standard deviations in terms of abilities that you cannot just bridge. It. I think that's the it's yes, like escape philosophy. That's that, that was my point as well. Like you know, if one of the biggest contention is that we should remove equality, but equality is inherent and going yeah. down that route, which is just going to make things worse. No, inequality in outcomes are inherent, but with the genetic modifications, you have inequality in sort of X yeah. and, and but, but abilities. Access, yeah, access to that uh, modification is also an outcome of inequality, right? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that on the, uh, the office the end, um, uh, the the there is I mean, you, could, you could use the same technology to cure inequality. I mean, there's a sense of um, yes, um, you know, finances and education and all those things play a big part in success or not. Um, but there are also you know there's a difference between Einstein and you know the person with uh, uh, mental disease like Down syndrome or um, and and no matter how much education and how much finance you give to the person with a severe mental disability, um, they're probably not going to become you know Einstein. Um, but if you use the technology, you could, you know, you could take those inequalities within this society that exists already biologically and reduce them. Um, or if we don't do anything and we just let things happen, you can go the opposite direction and make things even worse. Uh, where Einstein boosts his kids to give him that much more, you know. Um, so it's it's you know, technology really can be used for both good and bad. Um, so you got a point for it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just on the issue of uh, inequality. I think uh, something we have to keep in mind, like in liberal democracies, there's this assumption of political equality, mm -hmm. and that's based on you know, ideas about national equality, which yeah. combines with the law and Hobbes and things like that. And that's like a key fundamental precept in liberalism, liberal democracy. But these technologies that are coming online are going to undermine that precept. And so this uh, belief in liberal equality, like liberalism, will become akin to like religious faith. 
what people start to lose faith in that in those beliefs. Yes. So what kind of like political system would emerge when people start to lose faith or work? Well, yeah, and I think that that's a very good point that I should have added to my presentation is that the idea that um, yeah, I mean if you have you know um, Right now, like your responsibilities and your rights as a citizen are or based on assumption that you have certain abilities. But if someone was, you know, demonstrated like an enhanced human was demonstrably more reliable or more trustworthy than someone else, or maybe just much, much say faster reflexes, um, should they have to drive at the same speed as everyone else? I mean, if you can prove that they're actually safer drivers at you know four kilometers an than a normal driver at eighty, um, and there's a lot of like you know biological rights and and you know movements you could get from different populations, uh, you know, if you start getting like different people, this is the answer, so that's something right now, like we're all close enough, we're all enough close enough to be able to all fit into the same rule box, but um, yeah, there may be situations where we have to have like special rules for special types of enhancements, people, yeah, so yeah. So I do have one question for, for the, I guess more on the philosophy side, um, just because the, I'm very curious to hear any pushback or any comments on the moral and massive piece. Um, First of all, just sort of raise your hand if you believe it's possible to do moral enhancements. Um, like, for example, you know, there are drugs right now that, that have an impact such as making us more empathetic or making us more... But is that, to you, is that enhancement or not? Or is that just, uh, again, like, I mean, because it happened like, online, there's a really great discussion as to, you know, with, we can't, you know, the, the, the whole thing of, of um, if you're not moral to start with, you just add, you know, a, a, you know you're not actually making the person more moral, you just, yeah. Yes. Well, who's defining like moral and what's not moral? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 These drugs that are having these impacts are taking them are, are a form of moral enhancements. Um, but yeah, there's a whole discussion around uh, specifically like okay, so, so what does you know what is moral? Um, and, okay, so if it's like emotional sensitivity, like sometimes oh, sorry, I feel very proper in this thing. Like if it's about emotional sensitivity, like isn't the extremes of our emotions like? I, I feel like I'm probably much more not a futurist in this discussion, but it, like that's why I'm here. Um, is it not? Is that not like beautiful to have extremes in our emotions? Like, is that not where our greatest advancements and progress come from? Like, experiencing the ang like anger, experiencing like deep sadness or extreme happiness. And if you're constantly here, like without these like ebbs and flows, like that seems really, I don't know, just very depressing in my mind, at least. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, there's a question to us as to um, we may need to, like, uh, I mean, there's those things that are on the surface of your bad or some in short term, uh, but overall, we still need them to, yeah. Can you have any comments on this? Or the individual or Or whichever, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are more. Yeah. Uh, so, are we sort of assuming that with whatever genetic enhancements that are imposed in, in a cell, a zygote, or even a um, that epigenetic impacts either through the, the person's own lifestyle or even just how our world works with all the toxins and brain waves, et cetera, et cetera, um, that they're not going to impact what we're trying to force into the phenotype or the genotype. Oh, for sure. Actually, that's a good point. I, I didn't even touch on the epigenome. So, so basically, so for those who aren't familiar, the epigenome is, is basically it's the, so the genome is the DNA, it's the actual hard code. Uh, the epigenome is the expression of the DNA. So sort of like, um, like if, if the DNA is the, the movie script, um, the epigenome is the film. So in the sense that there's some creative, you know, and so for example, a person with a DNA that would, that would um, sorry, normally have them be like a tall person, if they grow up in a period of, of extreme uh, malnutrition, they may have short, that's, that's an expression of their genes, uh, that's, that's an example of the epigenome. Um, and ideally, uh, most of the modification, biological modification of human beings would be epigenetic and not genetic. Uh, because he could, you know, change it uh, much, much easier. Um, but so, so your question to the guy in general was... Well, well it's basically... Uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> 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 it, it's basically, if we, if we artificially change the genotype, are we 
assuming that there aren't going to be epigenetic effects on the genotype that are then going to sort of move toward or influence what oh. we're trying to... Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, it's, it's a, you know, the human body is, is massively, massively complex. The environment around it is even more complex. It is impossible to, to not, not have um, unintended consequences. I mean, there will definitely be things like either like a epigenetic backlash or, or other systems that will, that will balance that will drive you or, or maybe like, yeah, you know, so. I don't know if I got the question exactly. But I think you're assuming that we change just the DNA level, right? Um, and wondering if our current environment can also influence us as well, rather than just just change. You're such a saying that changing your DNA might not affect everything, but like your environment also plays a factor, right? Yes, because let's say I spend like hundreds of thousands of dollars on creating a being to be exactly the parameters A, B, and C, but then as the being lives through epigenetic impacts, those those parameters A, B, and C no longer present because of the the way that yeah. yeah so there's two things. First is the DNA um, is has a much greater effect than that than the actual epigenetics. Um, and then there's also random chance as well that we haven't actually figured it out yet. So like some, almost everything is partly genetic, somewhat, somewhat caused by environment, and then some other quasi like we have no clue we, right, right now. What um, and then the second point I do want to let you know is there are potential ways that we can change the epigenetics somewhat now, um, where we're, epigenetics is how you turn off and turn off different genes. Um, there is some movement on that side as well. And that doesn't necessarily need to be in babies. That could actually be in people who are actually alive. So there's some interesting science on that side too. Um, but you, the, the thought around actually changing just the DNA is enough to actually show outcomes, different outcome changes for the baby in the future. Right? Fairly good science. I'm, I'm going to have to open one last question and we'll uh, end it there. So. Maybe we'll <laughs> Not a question, just a comment. Uh, you have a hierarchy where uh, yeah. human enhancement was number two. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a little blown up because just like if you're watching a parade yeah. and you want to get a better view, you stand on a tiptoes, but pretty soon if everybody around you starts standing on your tiptoes, on the tiptoes, you lose your advantage. Right, yeah. so it becomes like a treadmill. You just have to run faster and faster just to stay where you are. Yeah. So with human enhancement, if it becomes available, and it's presuming it, it doesn't cost a fortune, very soon if everybody starts having it, it stops being an advantage. It's, it, it's a competitive differentiation which has stopped being one. So, you know, it may yeah. give you an edge initially, maybe, I mean, on a human span, maybe 50, 100, 200, 300 years, but over a few generations, once everybody has it, it's no longer an advantage. Like iPhone, in 2007, a few people had an iPhone. Today, practically everybody has an iPhone. It's no longer yeah. the device to want. Well, and, and, and so, yeah, so at an individual level, you're absolutely right. I think the, the reason I had it up at number two on the chart is because the this is sort of looking at the at like a 10,000 foot view on society as a whole, what's the biggest effect. And if there is precisely that, that dynamic of a rapidly accelerating change within the human being in capacity, um, if we are significantly more capable physically, mentally, um, then we can, you know, we can, all the other issues become less important because we can tackle things like, you know, catastrophic risk or automation or all those things much easier if we are more capable, right? Um, so, so, so on that note, um, I, I uh, have one last slide with uh, final thoughts. Um, so, based on everything we've had today and of the uh, conversation, uh, I think the, the, you know, the, the thing to remember uh, as we look at human enhancement is really to, that, you know, it's happening in a much larger context. And it, all of those other issues that I was showing on that chart could interplay with human enhancement as we go along. If there is a war, if there is a recession, how does that you know, accelerate or slow down developments in the human enhancement or adoption? Um, if we have a whole bunch of time in our hands, do we have, does that mean we have more time to discuss and get it right? Or does that mean we have more people fooling around and making mistakes? 
Um, there is really, it, it, it's a, I understand the 21st century is it almost a fool's errand because there's just so, so much going on. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it, it is like, um, if, with that in mind, uh, I think we can really, um, there are plenty of things that we can do to, to, to um, sorry, so, yeah, prepare for the future. Um, this is, I guess my, the point I want to leave everyone with is, is a sense of, sure, there's a whole lot of stuff that's completely out of control, um, but we are never helpless. Um, we can always uh, think more, we can always learn more. Um, and, and this is particularly close to my heart because I, I, I ran as a Green Party candidate when I was focused on climate change. Um, and I, I really believe that uh, as, as dysfunctional as politics and government can be, all of the big decisions are still being made there, uh, or at least many of them, most of them. Um, and you know, one of the things that you can do the next time a politician knocks on your door, ask them what their position is on human enhancements. Um, and they'll probably look at you with like a blank stare, I don't know what to say, but the more people ask them that, the more this, this discussion can be entered into um, a higher level of, of politics and, and policy. Um, and, and, you know, I come from the climate change movement. It, it took 30 years to get any semblance of movement to climate change. Um, you know, last four or 30 years, we could have, you know, common uh, design groups could be a common thing, right? Um, so we don't necessarily have, you know, 30 years to get to wait around for the discussion to slowly work with society. Um, there are plenty of things you can do, and getting it into the political discussion is an important one. But to do it, um, it takes a lot of understanding. Um, and uh, the last thing you want is like a an irrational uh, or a, a uninformed conversation with your nest. There could be a lot of fear on this, but not to, uh, it just makes the situation worse. Um, and, so, yeah, and so the last couple of pieces, of course, is well, thanks for coming up tonight. Thanks for being interested in learning. Um, Please, uh, if you have any more questions, reach out to me or do more research online. Or, or and and um, yeah, let your friends and family know about these issues. And then next time it comes as a opportunity, um, I uh, I look forward to being here. Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, where do you stand uh, in terms of uh, research? Uh, are you uh, giving the theoretical side, or are you trying to make an action plan, or are you trying to bring awareness? Uh, what is so, so you, where, where I stand on that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so so I'm I'm. I'm um, trying to save the world as any good citizen. Um, but still, I'm, so basically I'm trying to, at this stage, really um, increase awareness, um, uh, increase the quality of the debates, uh, create a debate in the version one. Um, I, ideally, uh, I'd like to want to start reaching out to political groups and getting them to start developing policies on this. Um, my ideal state would be to have like, you know, an election campaign where you have all parties have a position on this and have a, maybe have a healthy, you know, if you get a debate on, on where would you go with us. Uh, I think that's, that's like the, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm uh, hoping to answer for campaigns, but yeah. Practical question on that yeah. note, how would you empower people on your team to start thinking about these kind of things? I mean, I work with a lot of people in tech, but I find that oftentimes the, the skill set is so nuanced that they're not thinking about these sort of macro issues. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so if, I don't have a one size fits approach. Basically, at the, at the very least, if you see an opportunity to bring someone to the topic up, bring it up. Um, uh, you could also, I mean, if there are events like this, um, share them, or um, even just sharing articles in your Facebook feed that are relevant to this. I mean, there's a lot of small things that can be done that together start to build momentum. Um, and and um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm figuring this out as I go along well. Um, so I don't, but um, uh, certainly the, the uh, the more people think about it, the more reading about it, and, and talking about it, I think the better off we are, and, and the more we can harness this rather than the uh, like, so Yeah, thanks for coming out. Um, I think that's the end of the show. I think we have to wrap up for here. Yeah, thanks for, yeah. <laughs>